So VSTs are kind of a big deal. After their invention in 1996, they slowly went on to not only be the largest plugin platform ever, but also change the way we make and listen to music. If you don't already know, VST or Virtual Studio Technology is a platform that developers can use to make sound generating or effect plugins to use in almost any audio workstation imaginable. I did cover briefly where they came from in my History of Cubase video, so go watch that if you haven't. But here we're going to go much more in depth as well as explore the impact of the VST and how it became king. Before we get into the time period where digitally produced music completely disrupted the world of sound, let's explore what the world of music was like before digital plugins took over, and more importantly, before VST existed. This surprised me when I read about it, but the first ever recorded instance of someone understanding the possibility of digitized sound was all the way back in 1938. A British telephone engineer named Alec Harley Reeves filed a patent at the French Patent Office describing PCM or pulse code modulation. This would also get filed in the US about a year later and PCM would be the seed planted that led ultimately to where we are now with digital audio recordings and later digital audio generation. This invention technically wasn't a digital recording quite yet, it was just the basis for its existence. Interestingly, PCM is still used today, represented as WAV or other file types on your computer, and with that in mind, we can piece together why this leap forward was so pivotal for the steps to come. I read the Wikipedia page along with some Google Scholar articles about PCM, and well, I'm most certainly not qualified to give an explanation of how it works or what it does in any meaningful sense. But, at its most basic, it's a way to convert analog audio signals digitally by sampling them many, many times per second. That's why when you see the sample rate of a file, the higher it is, the better it will sound most of the time because it's more accurately reading each point of the waveform. PCM would develop slowly over the next few decades, getting refinements during World War II because the Allies needed a way to avoid telephone traffic being interpreted by the Germans, creating a scrambling system using PCM. The real jump forward here would be in 1957 when Max Matthews of the company Bell Labs, a subsidiary of Nokia, became the first person to digitally record sound onto a computer. This dude was pretty nuts as he wrote his own programming language called Music which was the first program ever to generate digital audio through direct synthesis. When we think of synthesis now, we might think of popular VSTs like Omnisphere or Massive which are absurdly powerful pieces of software in comparison to what they had back then. But music was a proof of concept and that's all that was needed to revolutionize the entire world of sound. Staying on the topic of Max Matthews for a bit here, this guy was absolutely brilliant. Not only was he essentially the godfather of digital audio recording and generation, but some other inventions created at Bell were way ahead of their time as well. Aside from creating the music and library like mentioned before, in 1968 William Nink developed Graphic One for Max to use at Bell Labs. This was a hardware and software product that used a light pen to draw figures onto an interface and convert those drawings into sound. It would be used in conjunction with the music and library that Max had developed himself to push the boundaries of what was possible with digital audio. This one device would end up being the precursor to all modern graphic based composition environments like you can find in Cubase, Logic, or Ableton Live. A second version of this device was created in 1976 called Graphic 2 as a commercial product to produce electrical engineering and logic schematics. Moving forward in time to 1969, the Japanese company NHK, or Japan Broadcasting Company, expanded the capabilities of PCM by adding a second channel for stereo audio as well as a 32 kHz sample rate. This step forward would lead to two different things. In 1970, James Russell, who was an inventor with a bachelor's degree in physics, submitted patents for the first ever digital to optical playback system. Reading a bit deeper into these patents, it's hotly debated how much influence this would have on the eventual creation of the compact disc. However, what is undisputed is the fact that over a hundred large technology and electronics companies viewed his first inventions such as Philips and Sony among many other interested parties. This was one of the first times ever we had the possibility of storing digitized audio, not on magnetic tapes, on the horizon. Only one year later, Dr. Takaiki Anazawa used NHK's new innovation to create the first ever commercial digital recordings. 
They were of multiple different artists' performances recorded live without any edits, and they were then released a year later in 1972. All of these different events were the bedrock for which VST would be built upon, essentially birthing digital audio which allowed VST to exist much later. Let's take a closer look at the company who made it and how it happened along with the crater sized impact they had on digital sound. By 1996, using computers to create music was already becoming sort of normalized. However, there were few options for developers to use as a platform to create plugins at this time. Mainly, DirectX came along about a year before VST and was used for quite a while. Steinberg, the company who developed VST, was known as a giant in the music industry already, creating the popular workstation Cubase among many other hardware and software products. The reason why this software was so important is because up until this point, computers were generally used for MIDI sequencing and audio recording. But with the advent of this technology, computers were now fully functional music making machines. Its success mainly stems from the decision to make the platform an open format for any developer to use not only to create their own VST, but also for any workstation providers to support them within their program. This created sort of a self-propelling effect, as the more people who used and supported the platform, the larger its reach became and would only cause more developers to get aboard the VST train. It's sort of like how Twitch streamers get popular. The more viewers that you have, the higher up on the list you are in the directory, which results in new viewers seeing their streams first, causing their numbers to go up even more. The more genius thing here though was the fact that a VST can be a VSTi, which is an instrument or sound generator, or a VSTFX, which would be an effect based plugin, or combine both into one housing effects within your sound generating plugin. The VST quickly took over as the go to for almost every single producer out there when it came to digital production. A side effect of this sweeping change was that it was now possible to emulate iconic analog instruments represented in digital form, like the Roland 808 or Mini Moog. Of course, there is a debate here on whether or not digital forms of these instruments perfectly replicate them since people swear by the imperfections and warm tones of analog sound. But regardless, it was a huge opportunity for producers. You no longer had to purchase expensive and large equipment, you could just buy a license of a VST and slap it right into your workflow. Getting back to its release, Steinberg themselves launched a few plugins to show what their new product could do, which were reverb, chorus, panning, and stereo effects. In version 1, it wasn't actually capable of sound generation quite yet, limiting it to effects only, however this would change in 1999 when VST2 came out. In my opinion, this is when VST cemented itself as the clear choice for the Hall of Fame of music software because like mentioned above, it was now possible to create sound generating plugins. VST2 would be the start of the downfall of most other competitors such as DirectX with many workstations dropping support for it during the 2000s because VST was so much better and had Steinberg backing it. Like I'd mentioned before, producers now had access to an absolutely monstrous library of digitally emulated synthesizers as well as newly minted VSTs that weren't based on any hardware at their fingertips for a fraction of the price. Analog synthesizers and drum machines could cost upwards of $10,000 at the time, which was pretty much not feasible for most people outside of professional engineers who were subsidized by labels or studios. This ushered in a new generation of kids to create their own music from the comfort of their bedrooms, some of which went on to become some of the most famous figures in the music industry. It's very hard to truly understand the scope of what this technology did for the world of music, or in some people's opinions did to ruin it, but regardless, it transformed it in spectacular fashion. I think it's important to note here that while VST most certainly broke onto the scene in an explosive way, there's a reason we covered the precursors to its invention as each step was just as important as this one. It's arguable that without the VST, the music landscape would be far different, causing some genres or artists to never have existed. But the genie was out of the bottle now, and my oh my did so many cool things come out of this technology. Some of the most widely used plugins were VSTs used to create sounds that define entire genres like dubstep, bedroom pop, and trap music. Plugins like the Isotope library, Omnisphere, or Keyscape are used in billboard charting songs, and who knows, those songs may have sounded different or never have been created at all without the use of VSTs. Not only that, these plugins gave way to an entire new wave of artists who sometimes had limited musical training. 
I myself have never taken a single lesson on music in my entire life, but I'm able to create some really cool things because of this technology. In a sense, the VST helped to further democratize music production, absolutely smashing down the barrier to entry for the average person, with a huge range of free-to-use instruments, effects, and libraries of sounds. Of course, most VSTs only exist within audio workstations, so we need to give credit where credit is due, as the developers of those programs were instrumental, no pun intended, in making VST a success. Outside of this, VST would also go on to bankrupt many studios, because now a producer with little resources no longer needed what was provided by a professional studio. Everything was right there, ready to go on their laptop to produce good sounding music. Of course, studios do still exist, but they were no longer a requirement for producers or artists wanting to make their own music. Another side effect of synthesizers now being digital was the fact that you could suddenly fit an absurd number of presets or samples into a single plugin. If you look at plugin libraries like Contact, for example, there are literally terabytes worth of sounds you can pack into this VST. I'd also mentioned at the start of this video that this technology changed the way we make music, but it also shaped the way we collaborate as well. Because a VST could be loaded into almost any workstation, you could now load up a plugin along with a MIDI file sent by a collaborator and have the exact same sound inside of your workstation even though they might have used a different one. On top of that, collaboration was now possible while being on the opposite sides of the globe, because everything went digital resulting in an unprecedented amount of musicians, artists, producers, and engineers working together on some of the best music of our time. Lastly, VST broke the linear live performance barrier that was in place previously. Live shows were generally pre-made ahead of time, playing one song after another in sequence. But now there are plugins at your disposal to create completely unique live shows, putting together effects, sounds, or even entire songs in the moment. Live remixes of songs also became more possible, making for some of the most entertaining electronic shows of all time, from the likes of Skrillex, Deadmau5, and tons of other brilliant DJs and producers. Needless to say, this technology was a leapfrog product, as Steve Jobs would say, and shaped the way music was made from its inception. I hope you guys enjoyed going on this journey with me exploring the world of digital music. Thank you guys for watching, stay safe out there, and I'll see you in the next video.